In 2010, the New York Knicks tried to lure then-free agent LeBron James to New York with a bizarre celebrity-filled recruitment video. That video has been dug up 14 years later by Pablo Torre, and he joins the show to talk about that historical artifact, what it signifies about the Knicks and their place in the basketball world and New York culture. Plus, private equity firms are preparing to invest in NFL teams, David Beckham is filing a lawsuit over a failed investment, and Utah is psyched for their currently unnamed hockey team. It's Monday, April 22nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NFL has not allowed private equity investment in teams yet, but the firms clearly think they might soon, and they want in. According to the Financial Times, at least two firms are preparing funds that would invest exclusively in NFL teams. That might be a requirement of the NFL when it does open the door to private equity. The league is the final holdout among major U.S. leagues in accepting private equity money. It was also the last one to fully embrace sports betting. The NFL likes to play these things slow and see how it goes for other leagues before jumping in. But this is a move people have been waiting to happen for a long time. As the $6 billion sale of the Washington Commanders showed, there are very few people who can afford an NFL team these days. That's made more challenging by league bylaws, which require that the primary owner hold at least 30% of the team. Opening the door to private equity could make it easier for future owners to put together a group and will allow current owners to partially cash out on those huge valuations. Along those lines, Buffalo Bills owners Kim and Terry Pegula are looking to sell roughly 25% of the team. Forbes valued the team at $3.7 billion last August, meaning the Pagulas could be collecting around a billion for a quarter of the team. David Beckham wants his money back, from Mark Wahlberg. The soccer legend and Inter-Miami co-owner is suing the actor's fitness company, F45, for $10.5 million over an investment he made in the company. Specifically, Beckham is saying that shares he was promised in the company were withheld from him until after the stock tanked. And tank it did. When F45 hit the public market in July 2021, you could buy their stock for just over $16 a share. Beckham was announced as an investor and global partner the following month, and he boosted the company with some social media posts. By the next February, it was mostly holding its value at over $15. Now, two years later, you can be the proud owner of an F45 stock for 15 cents. Beckham actually took legal action against F45 in October 2022, along with Live Golf CEO and Commissioner Greg Norman, but a judge ruled that they had to file their suits separately. Wahlberg owns 36% of the company. At the current market cap, his share is worth about half what Beckham is suing the company for. The people of Utah are ready for hockey. According to incoming owner Ryan Smith, more than 20,000 people have put down deposits for season tickets for the team that was the Arizona Coyotes this season and will be the Utah somethings next season. That's impressive, though it should be noted that those deposits cost only $100, and it's unclear whether the team will be able to honor all of them because the Delta Center, which the hockey team will share with the Jazz, has 12,000 seats with an unobstructed view for a hockey game, with plans to renovate the facility to bring that number up to 17,000. As for the name, trademarks have been filed for the Utah Blizzard, Utah Venom, Utah Fury, Utah HC, Utah Hockey Club, and Utah Yetis. Only one of these is good. First of all, let's cross out Utah HC and Utah Hockey Club. That naming scheme only works in soccer because it has a 100-year history, and we don't need to bring that to other sports. From my brief research, it seems Utah is not especially known for blizzards, venom, or fury, though the Gila Monster is venomous and native to Utah, and the Utah Gila Monsters would be a great name, but the Utah Yetis would also be excellent. Utah has snowy mountains, the sort of place a Yeti might live, there are fun mascot possibilities here, and it would randomly continue the cryptid theme started by the Seattle Kraken. Go Yetis. All right, very excited to be joined now by Pablo Torre, host of Pablo Torre Finds Out. Welcome, Pablo. Oh, and thank you for having me. Um, this story has consumed my life, so I'm glad to talk about it with someone else who's not in my own brain. All right. Yeah, well, I, I can at least do that for you. So that story is uh, you unearthed a video that the Knicks produced to recruit LeBron James to join them when he was a free agent and ultimately went to the Miami Heat in 2010. Stars James Gandolfini and Edie Falco reprising Sopranos. How did you dig this up 14 years after the fact? Yeah, it took years of my life. Um, and all I can say about it in public is that I found it at the bottom of a rabbit hole that I did not expect. Um, it all came together uh, very quickly after uh, literal years of trying. And so um, for reasons that are obvious, I cannot give up 
the source of my uh, my reporting, but uh, my God, I'm glad it's out there. Yeah, and so you must you clearly knew that this was out there somewhere. What did you know? And obviously, you're not going to give up sources, but what did searching for it entail? Yeah, I mean, I knew that there were rumors about this. There had been um, stories published that mentioned that Gandolfini had a cameo and there were these famous people who were appearing in it. And so the question of like, okay, how do I get to this? Um, Yeah, I mean, logically speaking, you deconstruct where could this video have been and who saw it? And so you end up with a conspiracy board of red yarn uh, that consumes my brain and also uh, an actual physical space. And you try to cross off every single letter on the conspiracy board. And uh, the good news was that enough people had seen it such that there were clues. Hmm. And uh, I should probably stop myself there, but there were clues. Okay, interesting. And why was it important to you that, that you track this down? Yeah, I mean, for me, I grew up in New York City. I grew up a Nick fan. I am somebody who was also, as I think lots of us were, um, consumed with, obsessed by, and infuriated by, in some sense, um, LeBron's decision in 2010. And so this question of, like, if there is any city in the world that could marshal together, like, the world's greatest bar mitzvah video, (laughs) essentially, the world's greatest, like, private plea, private cameo, to use the parlance of modern day, it would be the New York Knicks in the city of New York. And so there was just this question of like, how do you actually do this? How do you pitch the most important free agent of all time? And then in this specific circumstance, what did they do that didn't work so spectacularly? I think there was this notion that I always had based on both, um, I think, emotional resentments at the time, but also then later on uh, informed reporting that the Knicks were in a position to really get LeBron James. Um, And then as soon as their meeting in Cleveland, they had these meetings, these pitch meetings at the IMG building in downtown Cleveland. Seemingly, as soon as their meeting with LeBron was done, they were out. Mm -hmm. And so why? And this video always stuck out as like the biggest unanswered question, um, the biggest opaque wall I couldn't see through. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you feel like the video is part of the reason that LeBron never came to New York, that he just said like these people are are weird and not serious and like, treating me in a way that doesn't speak to the way I want to what I want this relationship to be I think it look all I can speculate on without having interviewed LeBron and I have um, reached out to LeBron's people and I know they have seen the episode and I eagerly await their verdict on uh, how much of a role it actually played in his mind um, I can only speculate that it played a role. But I also think it encapsulates the way that the New York Knicks as an organization were being run in 2010, which is very different from how it's being run today. Um, James Dolan walked into that meeting holding, and I didn't even put this in the episode, but I know it also to be true. Um, He walked into that meeting holding note cards he was reading off of that he was using to pitch LeBron James. And so the lights go down and he plays this video. And if you're LeBron, you're thinking to yourself, who is this man? And is this video the clearest example I have of his vision for how he sees me and how he sees the potential that I bring to a franchise that desperately needs me? And so when you get into the video, and I don't think it's fair to say that the Knicks knew that so many of the people in the video, beyond James Gandolfini, beyond Edie Falco, would wind up, as I say, um, with their brains eaten by the internet and or in jail. I don't think it's fair to say that they knew that Donald Trump would become what he is. Um, that Harvey Weinstein would become what he is, what Rudy Giuliani would become what he is, what Alec Baldwin would become what he is in all of their respective individual idiosyncratic ways. Um, and then on and on and on. I don't think they could have known that. But I think when you watch the video, you get a clearer sense of, oh, these are James Dolan's friends. He, he, he is choosing handpicking the people to be in the most important pitch video he's ever had to make for his basketball team. And in totality, I think it's hard to imagine LeBron didn't see this and walk away with a more informed sense of, oh, this who this is who my boss would be. And right. these are the people that I'd be hanging out with in some sense if I were to do this. Yeah, I mean, Dolan is is wrapped up in the Knicks. Obviously, every team owner is, is the team owner. But Dolan's presence around the Knicks feels somewhat unique to that franchise. And one that has been like this, this thing they've just been carrying around for 
Uh, I, when did he become the owner? Is it in the nineties or? Yeah, he inherited the team from his dad, Charles Dolan, um, mm-hmm. and so he's a, a nepo billionaire. You know, yeah. he inherits a team in the nineties, and from there, you can sort of kind of draw a parallel track to, um, yeah, the psychological torment of Knicks fans. Yeah. Um, ever since. Um, and, and you know, this year they're they're good again for you know the first time in forever. But I'm yes. wondering what actually what you meant by the the way the team is run is very different from from 2010 because Dolan's still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's taking a step back. I mean, that's the greatest compliment I can pay the Knicks as an organization. You know, one of the things that's fascinating about this specific pitch meeting in 2010 was that in the room was LeBron James's agent at the time, Leon Rose. Leon Rose is now the president of the Knicks. Hmm. And so in some sense, like here was a guy, one of the few people who saw this video in the room as it was intended. And I imagine that also informed his approach to like how he would maybe run this franchise differently. Should that ever come to pass in the future? (laughs) And Leon Rose is interesting, right? Like so much of Dolan has sort of been reapportioned to um, the music and entertainment side of Madison Square Garden and his interests. The sphere is something James Dolan is intimately involved in. Um, The musical stuff, he has this band, JD and the Straight Shot, which also happens to um, show up in the episode when we play a song that James Dolan wrote and performed about his friendship with Harvey Weinstein, Um, the aforementioned uh, guy, the predator who's in jail, right? So this is all very on the nose in terms of Jim Jim Dolan's fingerprints all over everything. Um, But the Knicks now are being run by guys who truly are so much more boring when it comes to their entertainment related ambitions. Um, Tom Thibodeau, you know, I I joke about this. We have in the video, Harvey Weinstein uh, doing, and another wrinkle to the video, which I loved about it, about the reporting was we found the alternate takes that they did really? for Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade. And so uh. we have Harvey Weinstein, not just pitching LeBron James, but we show you what he said to convince D Wade and Bosh to come right. to New York did not work. Spoiler alert, but he quotes Robert Frost and he has this whole thing about poetry and just like, it's absurd, but I am very confident in telling you, Owen, that Tom Thibodeau has no idea who Robert Frost is. <laughs> I don't believe that Tom Thibodeau thinks about poetry. He's about how to court celebrity. I think he's a monomaniacal tunnel vision guy. And for the Knicks, focusing on basketball has been the thing that's been missing because Jim Dolan was the guy running it for so, so long. Yeah, and I feel like you can play this game with almost any team, but it does kind of feel like there's something sort of cursed about big stars in New York when someone comes in to be like the guy who's going to take the Knicks to the next level, like, Stephen Marbury really didn't work out. Uh, Carmelo Anthony, Carmelo Anthony had some good years with the Knicks, but it's like that whole era just felt like it was never going to quite work. Um, and yeah, I feel like the fact that the Knicks don't have like the mega star, it's kind of these guys who sort of showed up and like just are overperforming or just you know, finding ways to be better than you think they are. Um, I feel like that's, that's what's working. And like, maybe that's not like the truth forever, but, but I think they need it. No, uh, there's something there, right? So much of the premise of like, we need LeBron. We are a city that runs on celebrity. Check out all our celebrities was about like, we need the big name. And sure. I would have loved LeBron James. Do not get me wrong at all. Would have loved Bosch and Wade and LeBron, but the team this year um, is led by Jalen Brunson. Yeah. who is not somebody you would have made a pitch video for, yeah. you know, OG Ananobi, uh, who they acquired in a trade from the Raptors is not that sort of a guy either. Julius Randall, absolutely not. Although he's hurt right now. So there is a like, Hey, what if we just focused on building a good basketball team thing that's happening? Um, and it's less entertaining from a, um, investigative gossip reporter like myself um, <laughs> when it comes to like this specific story, but it has been so much more effective when it comes to restoring the sanity of people who actually want to do the thing they wanted LeBron to do for them, which is potentially win a title. And, you know, so the, the Knicks, obviously they were, they weren't the center of the basketball universe in the nineties. Cause that was Jordan and the bulls, but the Knicks were, you know, they, they were right there. They were, they're big, they were relevant. Yes. They were New York. And then they had the Allen Houston era, which, you know, they not quite as good, but still very prominent team. And then at some point they just kind of stopped being, even though it's the Knicks, even though it's like the world's most famous arena, um, you know, still one of the most valuable teams in, in the NBA. It just seemed to stop 
like they st- they stopped mattering. And I'm wondering, thinking about this, if not getting LeBron was the moment when they went from there's still the Knicks, you still can't avoid them to like, actually, you can just forget about the Knicks. It felt like from that moment for about two decades after the Knicks just didn't really matter. It, it felt like a crossroads in lots of ways. And one of them was in the way of what is the story Knicks fans tell about themselves to themselves. Like we're the sort of city that any superstar, if you to give them truth serum and the ability to come here would opt in to becoming a Nick. And when that didn't happen, and Amari yeah. Stoudemire was a consolation prize, and for three months it was a fun consolation prize. But beyond that, it really was fallow um, in terms of that celebrity attraction. Kind of, um, I think the Knicks had to reinvent their own sense of self. And that brings us back to today. And yeah, I think the LeBron lesson was a massive one. Um, the Knicks were um, in the minds of so many, and I think in the minds of reasonable basketball observers, based on my reporting, were the favorite heading into the summer of 2010. And so was it the video alone that made it so that LeBron didn't want to come here? I am not saying that, but I am saying that all of this coalesced in a way that told LeBron and told Knicks fans in, in the same way that um, we need to consider uh, what it is that we do here and what we're actually good at. Yeah. And, and I also just feel like the basketball world has spread out. Like that was, I, I feel like in 2010, we were kind of past the moment of like, there are these centers of basketball where it's like the Lakers, the Bulls had, you know, their era had passed, but like the New York, just because it's New York still felt like it's supposed to be that. Like it's, it's the Yankees, it's, it's the Knicks. It's, you know, the, the I mean, the thing is like the Giants and Jets and Mets have this, like this long history. of No, but it's Broadway. It's the media right. capital of the world. It's all of the ways in which you're supposed to only be able to access what New York offers if you're in New York physically. Right. And what you're getting at is the idea that the NBA is globalized. Yeah. They find people wherever you can monetize yourself. However, across, you know, literal, like uh, invisible you know, not to sound like Al Gore, but in through tubes in the sky, right? <laughs> like you can get whatever money you want if you're playing in San Antonio as Victor Wembanyama is, or in the center of New York City as Jalen Brunson is. There is really no material disadvantage to marketing. Um, and so, yeah, the NBA had this inflection point and um, the Knicks realized that that wasn't a competitive edge anymore. And they're thankfully pivoting from that. Yeah. And I just feel like, right, it doesn't matter as much. Like you use, it used to be you'd hear people say like, oh, it's, it's a shame that Wembenyama is, you know, buried in San Antonio or Jokic is like, you know, playing up in the mountains in Denver where no one's watching him. It's like, no, like we're all watching all of these guys. And like, you know, I, I see just as many Wembenyama blocks, you know, on, on Twitter as I see like, you know, Jalen Brunson doing cool stuff. And yeah. so, yeah, it's it's just like the diverse the diversification of the media and like the accessibility of everything has kind of um, spread out the impact of places like New York and LA where they, they aren't, they're still the biggest cities. They're still like the, the cultural centers, but the, cult, the real cultural center is kind of just the internet now. Yeah. I mean, and the question is like, oh, right. I have an off season. So yeah. I'll go live in like, you know, Malibu or I'll live in, uh, you know, wherever in, in, in Chelsea, um, the West village, um, in my free time, you can do both. And, uh, yeah, I think that the, the 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 question really at the heart of this whole story was how do you win the heart of a free agent? And that proposition um has just radically changed since I think um the globalization of the game and the uh internetification of everything has become just obvious like oh right you don't need to be physically anywhere. You can you can you can monetize your brand remotely. Yeah. You know, to borrow the pandemic language of 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 work. Yeah. And last question for you Does LeBron to the Knicks still feel like this dream deferred that, you know, maybe in his final years, maybe they draft Bronny or something. And, you know, as like, you know, to like put a bow on it, like, wouldn't it be great if he like wore the Knicks jersey one for one season or 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 are we done that pass with that? No, I, I still think it would be an incredible story. I mean, for everything I said about pivoting away from stardom. The one thing that Madison Square Garden has as as the tangibility of a basketball in-person experience um, goes is the fact that the garden at its fullest, at its best, is, I think, the world's most famous arena. It lives up to the premise. And so LeBron James in that setting, um, I would love to see it. 
you know, it would be in classic Nick fashion, um, a degraded version in which nepotism is involved, which feels just like perfectly on the nose. On brand, yeah. On brand, but still, I think it would be must see television. Yeah. And in that way, as a basketball junkie, I am rooting for it, even if it's in no one's best interest from a basketball perspective, I should say. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Bible Tori, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Owen. That's it for today. Subscribe, rate, review. You won't regret it. We have great stuff coming at you every day. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.